When people think about the Chernobyl disaster, they imagine the abandoned ghost city of Pripyat, the decrepit sarcophagus, and the famous fallout zone in Ukraine. But what very few realize, however, was that just over the border with Belarus, radioactivity traveled and arguably caused even more damage. And although the Belarusian zone is not nearly as sensationalized, it presents a genuine picture of how nuclear fallout ravages humanity. Today, we learn about Chernobyl's Belarusian fallout zone. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. Chernobyl, most infamously known for the catastrophic nuclear disaster that almost wiped out Europe, occurred in northern Ukraine. And it's most associated with the nearby town of Pripyat, which was built for power plant workers and their families, but evacuated and left as a ghost town due to the radioactive fallout. However, a country that is rarely mentioned when discussing the disaster is the Republic of Belarus, north of Ukraine, which all the same shares an irradiated exclusion zone, just as eerie. On the night of the Chernobyl disaster, the wind was blowing north and carried huge amounts of radioactive fallout into Belarus. 70% of the radioactive particles emitted by the plant during the accident ended up in Belarus, contaminating almost a quarter of the country's territory. And the consequences were brutal. Birth defects, skyrocketing cancer rates, and other radioactive-linked horrors affected Belarus as profoundly as Ukraine, yet no one heard about it. The fallout was so bad that between 1985 and 2000, life expectancy in the regions affected dropped by five years. As a result, in the early years of Belarusian independence, the government invested over 20% of the national budget in tackling the problems of the disaster. USA Today documented some compelling first-hand quotes that paint a striking picture of the situation, starting with a 35-year-old art teacher who said, Many of us in the area have cancer or diabetes, and at least two-thirds of the kids where I teach can't do physical exercise because if they fall down, it's a very real possibility that they will break a leg or worse. He said, our lives are not good, and it's the same for all of the regions affected, and in Belarus, it's a secret that everybody knows. As he spoke, he placed one hand on the bike to help keep upright. He said, he did not know how many people were ill from Chernobyl and that the government never spoke about it other than to say everything was normal, but the teacher did not think everything was normal. We're in this position because of Chernobyl, but what can we do about it? He said, even after all these years, we know nothing. Now although the teacher feels people are uninformed, what we do know about the effects of the Chernobyl disaster in Belarus is very bad. A large increase in thyroid cancer happened amongst individuals who were adolescents and young children living during the time of the accident and residing in the most contaminated areas of Belarus. High levels of radioactive iodine were released in the environment from the Chernobyl reactor after the accident and accumulated in pastures which were then eaten by cows. The cows produced contaminated milk which was later consumed by children and is the most likely reason for the rise in radiation-induced thyroid cancer. Within two years of the disaster, the Belarusian government had designated the most toxic areas along the border with Ukraine as a fallout zone creating a state radiological reserve. Similar to that of Chernobyl and Pripyat, you can actually take a tour here and see the effects on the zone firsthand. The reserve, established in 1988, now covers an area more than 800 square miles, and it's divided into three regions. Before the disaster, this largely agritorial region was home to more than 22,000 people spread across 95 villages. Now, it's home to deer, lynx, bison, as well as 48 of Belarus's 189 species of endangered plants. No one officially lives in the reserve, though 746 people do work there, including 42 scientists. Other reserve employees work as border security and forestry or fire prevention. For the most part, the zone's buildings are bare. Tables, chairs, occasionally an abandoned boot or book, but none of the ghoulish decorations such as graffiti or arrangements of headless dolls and gas masks that characterize the tourism in the Ukrainian zone. 
you can find an occasional deserted school with toys propped upright on shelves, a scattering of gas masks, a book of fairy tales that have been left open besides maps and globes. However, this is not a presentation of historic insight. Although it happens rarely in Belarus, it's staged. Many of the visitors there have a code. They don't want to touch things or move them around themselves, but they want that viral photo to post on social media. So some of the local guides have created that apocalyptic still life for good marketing, but in Belarus, it's extremely frowned upon. Ukraine's Chernobyl tourism industry is already committed to this type of sensationalism, but in Belarus, it's really about preservation. They want to use the fallout zone for research and sharing of knowledge to preserve and respect its authenticity, but they recognize that dolls and gas masks are where the money is. The conflict here being that the authorities want to attract more tourists to the zone, but have not agreed upon a strategy yet. The exclusion zone officials have stated that they don't want more than 10 groups per month and that they detest the idea of the zone being trivialized by tourism. The evacuation that took place back in 1986 has been considered a mistake by many as villagers were moved into the city. These people lived their whole life in villages, working at collective farms, and then they were relocated to apartments called Chernobyl houses just east of Minsk. A lot of these people died young. Many became depressed and started to drink. They simply could not deal with or work in city life. So the second wave of people who were resettled from the edges of the zone were given houses in villages instead. The government apparently learned from their mistakes. Now alarmingly, much of the Belarusian zone has been converted back into farmland. Aside from corn and cattle, there are fields of freshly mowed grass used to make hay for the horses that are bred in the region. These horses are sold for riding and farming. Logging is also active in the fallout zone. Huge quantities of lumber are sent to Lithuania, a country famous for manufacturing at large scale and for known producers including IKEA. Another contrast to the Ukrainian zone is that the Belarusian radiological reserve lacks a solid border or markings, and this is a very different situation than that of Ukraine, where police are standing on by with Kalashnikovs watching over checkpoints. It would be easy for anyone to ignore a warning sign and just walk straight in. So why don't they do it? Because the penalties are severe for anyone caught trespassing. However, once a year, on the weekend after Easter, the citizens of Belarus are given free reign to drive their own vehicles into the zone and visit their former homes and the graves of loved ones. Children can even go. And while visitors are expected to carry identification, they are not required to pass through any radiation control later. One local declared that people don't steal metal or enter the more contaminated areas which are strictly off limits. He quotes, because they know it's bad to get caught and that the penalties are even worse for foreigners. I find it fascinating that the punishment for illegally visiting the zone is so bad that very few would dare to do so, yet wood from the zone can be exported to the European Union. Belarus is one of the former post-Soviet countries that in many ways upholds the old-school authoritarian approach to government, so I believe that the consequences for breaking the law there could be very bad. With that being said, Let's just hope that they have not also retained the Soviet approach of containment of radiation, because the reasons will be obvious for at least another 24,000 years.